Hey, Flight Path family, Pastor Joe here. I wanted to take a moment and introduce today's sermon to you. It's a first-person narrative sermon uh, based on the life of David, and it was given for a special Father's Day message here at Flight Path Fellowship. Uh, this message was inspired by a sermon transcript by Hatton Robinson, so I wanted to give some credit to him because this is my portrayal of uh, the message that he originally put together. So thank you very much. May it bless and encourage you as you watch today's message. Uh, children, start children off on the way that they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn away from it. That's Proverbs 22, 6. Just as fathers, just think about that today as we're going along. But I want to introduce our special speaker today. Any kids that haven't gone to the kids, go to, you go to your kids' church. Thank you, Ed. My name is David. I hear that's a pretty popular name around here. Not as popular as Mike, but still pretty popular. You might know me better as King David. I uh, have somewhat some fame in the Bible, as you guys call it. We call it the Scriptures. Um, I, I was invited here by your pastor today to share with you about a special message for Father's Day. That's something that I know very little about, even though I have 20 kids. I will get there. Let me start somewhat near the beginning. I was, I was the youngest of eight sons of Jesse. Jesse was my dad. And, and he, he was older in age when he had me. And, my, and, and so he sent me out to the fields to take care of his flock of sheep. So I was a shepherd. It wasn't a very glorious job, but... It was one that I loved. I loved that job. And I, I think I loved it so much because I liked being alone. I mean, I, it's where I really crafted my skills as a musician. I started playing to the sheep. I mean, there were a captive audience, so it was pretty easy. But I played with the sheep, and I played, and I, and I, and I sang to them. I poured my heart into my music, and, and I learned really how to play really, really well. But it wasn't not only that where I learned to play music out there in those lonely nights. The Lord gave me the opportunity at that time to, to learn how to fight. And that's something that I could do really well. I knew how to fight. And I learned because taking care of a flock of sheep every now and then, a bear or a lion would come up against us, and the Lord always granted me victory. It's kind of amazing to think about. I'd use my sling, and I thought I'd go and, and, and just kill it. I'll never forget one day I was out tending the sheep and I got a message that came to me. And the message said this, come back home, there's a prophet of the Lord in the house and he wants to see you. I was a pretty young man. I, I ran back to the house and when I got there, my father and all my brothers were there. And Samuel, the prophet of the Lord, came. And in that moment, he said, yes, this is the, the Lord's anointed one. And he poured the horn of oil over my head and anointed me to be the next king of Israel. As a little boy, I didn't really know what that meant exactly. I knew we had a king, but it wasn't much of a kingdom then. So he anointed my head and said I was going to be the next king of Israel. And, and, and at that moment, I will never forget this presence of God Almighty that came over me. And from that day forward, the Spirit of the Lord came so powerfully among me and on me that everywhere I went, I knew that God was walking with me. It was truly an amazing feeling. It was pretty awesome. I, you might have heard about my battle with Goliath. That was pretty fun. There was this giant who was taunting the armies of Israel. My father asked me to go check on the other boys and see how they were doing. So I took some supplies and I went out to the battle line. And here's Goliath screaming, I'm Goliath, strong and mighty. Who is brave enough to fight me? And I'm just like, dude, somebody's got to take this guy down. <laughs> and I just prayed and said, Lord, if I'm your guy, let me do it. And I felt the presence of God come on me again. And I said, I went right to King Saul and said, Saul, I will take him down for you. He said, he's a little kid. I said, the 
presence of God is on me, I will take him down just like I took down that bear and that lion. God will be with me. He will be my strength. And man, he fell. The giant fell. From that day forward, I wasn't a shepherd man. I became a warrior in King David and King Saul's army. And oh, it was quite amazing to be there fighting. I was good at it. Man, I was good at fighting. <coughs> the feeling that you get is unlike anything else. And I could take a man down and I slayed men. It was said to me that King Saul had slain his thousands, but David had slain his tens of thousands. Now, that might be exaggerating a little bit. But I was good at fighting. So good, I started winning over the hearts of the people. For about 15 years, me and my best friend Jonathan, who happened to be Saul's son, man, we were best buddies on the battlefield. And one day, I was, I was, because I was a skilled musician, I was, I was playing for Saul. See, back then, Saul had some demons that he was fighting, and, and I would play some music for him. And that seemed to be the only thing that calmed those demons down when I played that music in that heart. But one day, as I was playing, the Lord protected me so well. He took this, Saul took this spear and chucked it right at me. Man, it almost took my life. I saw it from like, whoa. And I ran. I spent many years running from Saul until the day he died. And he died the same day that my best friend Jonathan died. But that's when I knew that it was time to step up and take my throne. But I didn't get the whole throne right away. It took about seven years. And I was just the king over the tribe of Judah and Hebron. I don't want to brag myself, but, but my reign was pretty amazing. The kingdom that I got was chaos. But I turned it into a glorious kingdom. Some of the things that I was able to accomplish during my reign really is I brought the ark of God back into Jerusalem. I drove the Jezebites out of Jerusalem so it could be our city alone. I instituted Congress and I put a secretary of agriculture in place. Really, Jerusalem became, it was known as the city of David. I built an amazing, amazing kingdom. I'm not here to brag, though, even though that's what it seems like I'm doing. Because your pastor asked me to talk about Father's Day. And that's one area where I honestly can say that I failed. They say that failure is one of the best teachers. And if you learn anything from me today, you can learn from my failure. I want to share a quick story with you. As time went on and as I was king, I got a little complacent. I sent my army off to war without me. I wasn't fighting on the front lines anymore. And I went up on the roof one day and I saw this beautiful woman. She was gorgeous. And I said to myself, I gotta have her. So I sent for her. And I committed adultery that day. You might know her name. Her name's Beth Sheba. I didn't realize at the time what that decision would do to my family or my legacy. And I had to cry out to God, my God, my God, please, please forgive me. And he did. He forgave me. He cleansed me as far as the east is from the west, so far as my God removed my transgressions from me. But the thing about it was, even though he forgave me, there was still consequence to my decision. Not only did she get pregnant when she had the baby, the baby died. And I mourned and cried out to the Lord to save him while he was still alive, but the Lord didn't listen. That wasn't the only consequence. My son, Amnon, saw what I had done and had a very similar attitude. You might have heard it before, but the, the 
sins of the father are passed down on to the next generation. And my son Amnon looked at his half-sister Tamar, my daughter, and he said the same thing. She's beautiful. I have to have her. And he tricked her one day, took her home, and he raped her. And I was so angry at that kid. Oh, I wanted to I wanted to I wanted to discipline him so bad, but I couldn't. I couldn't bring myself to discipline this kid for the same act that I had done. And so I let it go. Even though I was angry, I didn't discipline him. I didn't do what a father should have done in that moment. I let the sin go. And that was the wrong thing to do. Because after that, his half-brother, Absalom, my third oldest child, Tamar's full brother, was pretty angry. Rightfully so. He was, he was, he was so angry. He, it took him a couple years, but he came up with a plot to kill his brother, Amnon, and he did it. He wanted to seek revenge for what he did to his sister, Tamar. I mean, the kid not only raped her, he threw her out like trash. If you would have asked, I would have given her to him in marriage, but he threw her out like trash. And it killed Absalom to the point where he got so upset that he had to take things into his own hands, and he did it. He killed my son, Amnon. And it drove a wedge into my relationship with Absalom that was so big. Three years. Three years he fled. And I wanted him to come back home. And I called for him to go, come back home. I sent my commander Joe after him. I said, bring my son home. And he decided to come, but I couldn't bring myself to see him. For two more years, we were in the same city, but I never saw my son Absalom. Couldn't see him. I wasn't mad at him. He did what I... I wanted to see him, though. Man, you should have saw this kid. I think my hair is gorgeous. You should have seen his. <laughs> Whew, he's a looker. All the girls know, too. Not only was he good-looking, he was a charmer. He knew how to get people's attention. He knew how to weasel his way into a situation and make himself look like him. Most prime piece of meat you'll ever see. Absalom, my son. I should have saw it coming, but I didn't. I was so busy looking for enemies outside my city walls that I never saw the own enemy rising up within my city. My own son started smoozing over people and winning their hearts. And before I knew it, he had an entire army on his side, ready to overthrow me and take the kingdom for himself. I had to flee for my life with my army in tow. Some of my, some of my best buddies and the most amazing, powerful warriors you'll ever see came with me. We left the city and, and Absalom took the city for himself. He took it over. But that wasn't enough for my son. He wanted everything. He wanted more. He wasn't going to be happy. He wasn't going to be satisfied until not only did he have the throne, but he took me out of the picture completely. And he did something detestable. See, I had a sin that I did in secret. I committed adultery with Bathsheba, sent her husband off the war to die so that I could have her as my wife. From that, God said, one of your very own will fall into the same trap and, and he will do it in the open in front of all of his will to see. And he did an act with all the concubines left behind, <coughs> right in front of the whole city for them to see what he was doing, just to detest me. And I don't want to be too graphic. But he hated me. He hated me. Battle was coming. I knew it. They knew it. My, my, my commanders knew it. We were going to go to battle with my son. And I didn't know what to do. Either way, I lost. If we won the battle, I lost my son. If we lost the battle, I lost my kingdom. Everything I'd 
worked for and built, and probably would lose my life. As I was working and, and, and talking with my commanders, they said, you should stay here. Stay here, don't go off the panel. I didn't know if they were just trying to protect me or they said I was too important for the cause. I think it was just an excuse. They thought I was too old to fight. So I stayed behind and I anxiously awaited. I anxiously awaited to hear from news of the battle. I saw a young man running towards me. I'm like, oh, this has got to be good news. And so he was wondering, he was, he was coming alone, he's, he's got to be bringing good news from the battle lines. As he came, he said, my Lord, my Lord, there's great news, we have won. I said, what about my son Absalom? He said, I don't know. And another brother was behind him, Cushite, he came and he said, my Lord, there's good news from the battle lines, we've won. But what about my son? He said, Son was dead. I lost it. In that moment, I cried out, My son, Absalom, my son! My son! Why couldn't I have died instead of you? My son, Absalom. I heard later that. His hair got caught in an oak tree as he was riding by. He was uh, hanging there. And one of my generals came by and threw fierce three darts through his heart. I pleaded and I begged with my generals before they went to battle. I said, guys, please take it easy on my son Absalom. Take it easy on the young man. They weren't torn like I was. They weren't loyal to Absalom like I was because he was my son. To them, he was just a traitor. Somebody trying to overthrow the kingdom that we had built. I was broke. I was broke. And Joab knew it. Joab, I thank God for Joab. Because when he came to me, he brought me out of my brokenness and said, Lord, you need to take your place as king. So I went and sat at the gate. Not that I wanted to be there, not that I was there mentally, I was broken. But I took my seat at the gate as king so that no one else could come up against me. And I took the kingdom back. And the Lord gave it back to us that day. But I was broken. I believe the reason that I'm here today to speak to you is to share with you my failure, but to encourage you. It may look like time is your friend, but time is your enemy. It goes so fast. I was too busy my entire life running and ruling this kingdom, that I didn't take the time to invest in my relationships with my children. I understand things were different back then. It was our culture, it was normal to, even though God said to only have one wife, I didn't listen and I, and I had multiple wives, multiple relationships with multiple children. It was just too much, what could I do? I was running a kingdom. I couldn't do everything. I had to, I thought God was calling me to rule this kingdom. How can I take care? I left the children to their mothers. And that was the worst thing I could have done. You always think you'll have another day, but you're really not sure when that day is going to be ending. So if I can encourage you today, the first point is you need to be with your children, present, and available. There's a commandment. It's the greatest commandment in all of scriptures. In Deuteronomy 6. It said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And I was 
really good at that. That's amazing at that. I love God. You read throughout scriptures. I wrote over 70 songs and praise God. And I poured out my heart and you can recite them by memory. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not be in want. problem is the verse goes on and it goes on to say to impress these commands onto your children's hearts to talk about them when you lie down and when you stand up when you're walking down the road and that's where I messed up it's not enough to just be present with your children but you need to give them an example to follow I want to encourage you today to be present, to not make the same mistakes that I have, and be an example, and love the Lord your God, and impress these commandments on your children's heart. It's not too late. It may be for me. Son. Absolutely. My son. Thank you. Before we head out today, I do want to wrap this up. You can sit for a minute because I'll probably be more than one minute. Deuteronomy. 6 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments I give you today are to be on your heart. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. King David's story can be found in 1 Samuel, all the way through 2 Samuel. But today's sermon was based off of chapters 13 through 18, specifically. And I don't want anybody that's not a father in here to miss the point of the message. And that's why I came back up. While it was tailored to dads, if you don't have children, or if you're a single mom, there are spiritual fathers in the kingdom of God. And men, if you don't have children, you can be a spiritual father, an example to somebody that doesn't have a dad that loves the Lord. That is the most important thing, is we can impress on these children how to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, with all of our soul and with all of our strength. And I want to encourage you to do that. I want to leave you today with a blessing and a prayer. So I'm going to pray this. Lord Jesus, I ask that you will indeed bless the fathers that we have among us today. That you will give them opportunities to invest in their children, not just in their jobs or occupations. Lord Jesus, will you bring a strong conviction among us, not only at Flight Path, but as a people group in followers of Christ to be spiritual fathers, to invest in children, because they're not just the church of tomorrow. They are the church of right now. Holy Spirit, I thank you for your convictions, and I thank you for leading us in that ask, Lord Jesus, that you will shine your face bright upon each and every individual in here this week, that you will bless them and keep them and give them strength by the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.